Late yesterday, February 3rd, U.S. Central Command released this statement. As part of ongoing international efforts to respond to increased Iran-backed Houthi destabilizing and illegal activities in the region, on February 3rd at approximately 11.30 p.m. Sana'a time, U.S. Central Command forces, alongside U.K. armed forces, conducted strikes against 36 Houthi targets at 13 locations in Iranian-backed Houthi terrorist-controlled areas of Yemen. These multilateral coalition strikes focused on targets in Houthi-controlled Yemen used to attack international merchant vessels and U.S. Navy ships in the region. These Iranian-backed Houthi targets included multiple underground storage facilities, command and control, missile systems, UAV storage and operations sites, radars, and helicopters. These strikes are intended to degrade Houthi capabilities used to continue their reckless and unlawful attacks on U.S. and U.K. ships, as well as international commercial shipping in the Red Sea, Bab al-Mandeb Strait, and the Gulf of Aden. These strikes are separate and distinct from the multinational freedom of navigation actions performed under Operation Prosperity Guardian. This strike comes in the wake of a number of Houthi attacks into the Red Sea in recent days. On February 2nd, nearly a dozen one-way UAVs, as CENTCOM has started calling them, were shot down by Arleigh Burke-class guided missile destroyers Kearney and Laboon using SM-2s and Super Hornets from Carrier Air Wing 3 aboard Eisenhower using air-to-air missiles, most likely Sidewinders. The day before that, CENTCOM forces took out an Iranian-supplied Houthi uncrewed surface vessel, a USV, in the Red Sea as it was approaching shipping lanes after U.S. Navy assets on the scene determined it was an imminent threat. And later that day, the Houthis fired two anti-ship ballistic missiles toward the merchant vessel Koi in the Red Sea, but those hit the water without damaging the ship. So a quick review here. There are basically three fronts in the Iranian proxy war that broke out in its present form on October 7th. The first front is the one involving Israel and Hamas in Gaza, as well as Hezbollah in Lebanon and the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank. The second front is between the Iranian Republican Guard Corps, IRGC, and associated military groups located in western Iraq and eastern Syria who have been conducting hundreds of attacks on U.S. outposts and garrisons in the region that were established during the fight against ISIS and remain there theoretically to assist the Iraqi government with stability and security, although recent statements by the Iraqi government have cast doubt on how well that's working. And the third front is a conflict being waged between the Houthis in western Yemen and the U.S. Navy and coalition warships stationed in the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden. We've covered this in previous episodes over the past few weeks, but just as a reminder, the Houthis are an Iranian-backed Shia Muslim group that seized control of several what they call governorates in the western part of the country during the Yemeni revolution of 2011. They fought with Saudi Arabia in the years after that and suffered tens of thousands of casualties from Saudi strikes, but despite that, they remained in power in western Yemen and their influence has only grown since. After the Israeli Defense Force invaded the Gaza Strip in response to the Hamas terror attacks on kibbutzes in southern Israel on October 7th, the Houthis vowed their support for Palestinians and started attacking commercial shipping they claimed was bound for Israel. The U.S. Navy responded by forming the Ike Carrier Strike Group as well as warships from partner nations like the U.K., Australia, the Netherlands, and India into a task force called Operation Prosperity Guardian. Prosperity Guardian was designed to protect commercial shipping from Houthi drones, any ship missiles, and small boat attacks. The Houthi arsenal is supplied by the Iranians and includes several models of unmanned vehicles including the relatively inexpensive and slow-speed Shahid drones as well as the more sophisticated Samad 3. Of greater concern is their inventory of anti-ship ballistic missiles, which found their mark at least once in the past weeks, causing significant damage to the merchant vessel Marlin Luanda. As mentioned, the Houthi attacks since mid-October of last year have been countered by missiles fired by American and British warships, and in one case on January 30th, the Houthi weapon got close enough to the USS Gravely that the destroyer employed its close-in weapon system, or SeaWiz, to down it, which was the first time that system was used in this theater. And in addition to employing heat-seeking Sidewinder short-range air-to-air missiles to down Houthi drones, the Super Hornets have reportedly also fired AMRAAM medium-range active missiles to take out any ship missiles. Despite all of these efforts, the defensive nature of Prosperity Guardian has not proved to be a comprehensive deterrent to the Houthis. Therefore, American and UK forces have conducted more than a dozen offensive strikes, which CENTCOM calls defensive strikes, on a range of targets in western Yemen using Tomahawk land attack missiles fired from warships in the Red Sea and GPS and laser-guided bombs dropped from U.S. Navy carrier-based and U.K. Royal Air Force land-based jets. 
Analyzing the targets in yesterday's strike as outlined in CENTCOM's release, if X equals things like radars, that's a mission for EA-18G growlers using their high-speed anti-radiation missiles, better known as HARMS. If we're talking command and control, missile systems, UAV storage and operations sites, and helicopters parked on a ramp somewhere, those are custom-made for the Tomahawk land attack missiles. TLAM is a subsonic cruise missile that has been around for decades, and the U.S. Navy is currently using the Block 5 version, which has improved survivability features, including the ability to jam enemy radars to keep from being shot down. TLAM is getting a Joint Multi-Effects Warhead System, or JMUSE, next year, but it currently is not effective against hardened targets. So where CENTCOM mentions multiple underground storage facilities, the first time we've seen those on a target list, by the way, that sounds like a job for Super Hornets dropping GBU-24s. As we've discussed in a couple of previous episodes, the GBU-24 is a 2,000-pound laser-guided bomb that can be weaponeered with delayed fusing that allows it to penetrate a hardened structure before exploding once it reaches the inside. Unlike a GPS-guided JDAM, which has been used extensively by CAG-3 airplanes in recent weeks, as well as B-1s that hit the targets in Syria and Iraq day before yesterday, laser-guided GBUs need to be controlled by the aircrew until impact using their targeting pods attached to the airplane. We don't know which squadron was tasked with these targets, but ideally it would be the two-seat FA-18F where the weapons system officer in the rear cockpit was focused on the FLIR presentation as the bomb was in flight while the pilot continued to aviate and look outside for threats. And while it seems like every day there's a new CENTCOM tweet dealing with the third front of the Iranian proxy war, it's important to understand that severely impairing, not to mention eliminating, the Houthis' ability to attack shipping is iterative in nature, meaning they launch an attack, we react to what we see, they attack again, and we react again. But each time the intel picture builds, which allows us to be more effective in our choices of targets. Another reminder of something we've previously discussed here is that 15% of the world's shipping passes through the Bab el-Mandeb Strait and the disruption the Houthis are trying to create would have a significant effect on world markets if allowed to go on unchecked. That's why Operation Prosperity Guardian exists and that's why there's also an offensive strike element to it. All right, that'll do it for this episode. As always, we'll stay on top of these situations and provide the information as it becomes available. So, if you're not already a subscriber, become one so you don't miss anything going forward. And in the meantime, I look forward to talking to you again very soon.